I head off to Los Angeles to promote uh, my first concerts in over 10 years. Um, I get a chance today to speak to somebody um, who is really one of the most decorated younger musicians that that I have come across in a long time. And even before I started, even before I started to do research on this cat, um, it, I wound up in Scottsdale at uh, a house that the uh, Sam Grisman Big Band was uh, staying at, and it turned into this whole full-on jamboree, hoot and nanny, and everybody was just picking and grinning, but my guest, um, there was something about him that right away I recognized that he had obviously been um, not just playing music, but in, in a communal spiritual way had been creating music with uh, family and friends for a long time. Um, he did not seem, um, seems like you could throw almost anything at him and he'd be able to do it. Um, and then when I actually started to look into his, not just his resume, but uh, people he's played with, and the, just the, the, the intensity and the veracity with which he has gone after uh, learning different instruments, learning different styles of music, and then playing it on the bandstand in front of people, it's, it's very inspirational, and I love the fact that this will be my last interview before I hit the road. Aaron Lip. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thank you, brother. So glad to be here, and so great to meet you in Scottsdale, and appreciate you reaching out. Absolutely, man. Um, it is really an honor. You know, I, I wanted to just ask you right off the bat, um, like, what was, growing up, how would you describe the family music? And what I mean by that is, I mean... People are like, oh, I'm, you know, uh, they set out to be some kind of professional musician or they want to be on the bandstand. But, you know, I've interviewed enough cats that grew up with families that played music and it seemed to um, revolve a lot more around community, having fun, and inspiring people. And I just kind of wanted you to talk about maybe a specific time early in your life when um, those kinds of feelings entered into your zeitgeist. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and something that, um, yeah, I think about often because I, I grew up in a really musical family and the way that I gravitated towards it, it was, it was kind of a way of life because I, we had a piano in the house, my, my mother's piano gifted to her by her grandmother. And it was kind of a centerpiece of the living room which i i think is a really important thing if you want your kids to play music to have a have a piano in the center of the living room like a big piece of furniture that you're just really inclined to sit down at because it's there and it's beautiful and it's it sounds good and it it fills the room with a different type of magic you know <laughs> much, <laughs> much different than than a tv or oh something my God, like absolutely um, <laughs> so there was there was no uh there it, there was like uh um, there was no like technology in that room. It was strictly a, a music haven. Right. There, there was no TV in that room. We did have another room with a television, but, but I didn't grow up with any reception. So it was only like, uh, v, VHS. <laughs> oh, this know? is the greatest. This is, so you had no way of getting at, you had local, maybe if you were lucky, you had a couple of local stations. That was it. Uh, no, we, we didn't even have that. We, we grew up in this, this really rural, high valley, um, you know, so just south of Naples, New York, in the Finger Lakes, a really beautiful spot. My parents uh, bought five acres. My dad built the house with his bare hands. Oh, yeah. And and he was, he was a great musician when he was, um, I mean, he still is, but he was an amazing bass player growing up and, and then got into folk music when he met my mother who who sings and plays guitar <clears throat> and her father played as well and it was just a really music you know music full household it was my, my dad was really into all different kinds of funk and blues and oh my and, god and, this and, is and insane fusion. so we, he came from that camp and yeah. then Combined with all the folk and bluegrass and old time and country from my mom's side of the family, it was a pretty 
it was a pretty good place to start and uh the piano was where i started um and then when i became a teenager i got into all kinds of crazy punk rock and and metal and stuff that i started playing guitar this is no but you said the right thing that i you know just sort of muddled through in that question is i just want you to talk as best you can free form the way of life of music like that's the way that it was you were raised that way of life meaning there is no uh, whatever that western dogma uh idea of success quote unquote doesn't apply to the way of life when you're playing spiritual music and i just wanted you to go a little bit deeper on that because yeah, just I would love you to talk to the audience about that. I think it's really important, especially for younger musicians. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'd love to go deeper into that. So part of it was was being in a place where there weren't nearly as many distractions as as other places. I, I think, you know, the, growing up in the country where I couldn't just walk to a friend's house in town and I couldn't always get a ride because, you know, parents were busy sometimes I mean, I, but it was like that's all that i had to do in a certain sense i could play outside but i chose i gravitated towards music a lot um for one reason or or another and and it would just became this thing that i i became obsessed with it and i became obsessed with scott joplin piano rags I was mm. playing ragtime piano oh, when i was man. when i was really young and i had a couple a couple good piano teachers when i was a kid but my dad really got me going uh playing by ear because he was really good intuitive musician and and he really he started my ear training when i was like four years old which is why it's been easier for me to just hear something and be able to play it now it's um but, it, it, you know, to go deeper into that way of life thing, it was something that I grew up seeing my parents do and other relatives and my friends' parents as well, because we grew up in this rural community where there were like maybe five or six families that we had all these potlucks. There were a lot, <laughs> a lot of yeah. potlucks yeah. and a lot of, a lot of people running around barefoot, kids getting hurt, hitting each other in the head, skinny <laughs> dipping, you know, crazy stuff like bands playing in garages and friends parents bands and square dances that's where i heard my first fiddle music was this this um, band called the henry brothers string band up here i heard my first flat picking guitar from this guy bobby henry when i was really young and and it was just kind of was really infectious so it was, it's a combination of of like not having the distractions i mean there were no cell phones then either none of us had a cell phone when i was that young even if you did you probably wouldn't be able to have reception up there you know <laughs> i mean it's possible right you know? <laughs> right right yeah that's true when i did get one there there was no reception <laughs> <laughs> so i just want let, let's be clear though like the, this was like you became obsessed because it was fun it was a challenge but your your folks did not make it a tedious exercise. They pushed you out of your comfort zone, but the, but the idea of music communally was supposed to be, the reason I bring this up is because, <clears throat> I'm, and I'm going into more the, the jazz realm, uh, which, by the way, I believe, uh, were you in, are you, is, is Rochester the closest city to where you were, or am I dreaming that, or, or were you? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's the closest major city. Um, Canandaigua is, is a smaller city that's that's closer to me but rochester is the biggest like closest well-known which was a bastion i mean obviously eastman is there but Mm -hmm. it it was a bastion of soul jazz way way before me or you were ever born i mean it was richard groove holmes would come through with a hearst with his b3 in the back to play the pithod club i don't know if that club is still there but it's like you know I in the jazz realm now, or if you're just playing original music, um, it, a lot of it is based today on like really sophisticated charts, um, a lot of facility, a lot of chops, a lot of riffology, and I mean, 
and there's a place for that, but at the same time, a lot I, I oftentimes just wind up staring at the wall. It's pretty sterile, and mm-hmm. uh, it can be anyway. And I just feel like, um, <clears throat> you know, to me, that out that's what came across to me in Scottsdale was this idea of, and it was it was the whole group. It was just it was like. I ha- Aaron, you know, I mean, I go see a lot of live music, but I've ne- that was the first time that I was like, and that was probably your 900th time, but for me, it was like showing up and just seeing all these cats just, just, just playing. Nobody's, no critiques, no judgment, just having a ball. Now, again, you have to have the rudiments, but I just, to me, sometimes music, I just, maybe the question is, how did you learn to take what you do seriously, but not take yourself so seriously. There's nothing worse than a a self absorbed you know person who's just wanking it up there. You and, and that's the thing I love about say, that this band is that it's just about gritty, greasy, you know, bringing people to tears. You know. Mm-hmm. So I just wonder yeah. how you learn. You know, ultimately maybe that came from your father and your mom, but also like how have you learned over time to just basically say, you know, I'm going to be who I am and I'm not going to, and I'm going to take what I do, my craft very seriously, but I'm still going to have a good time and I'm not going to pretend that I'm, you know, some high, cause you, I mean, there's a lot of cats with your chops that would be like, could be very dismissive of other people. So how, I mean, how have you become more inclusive as a person, mm. as a musician? I, I would say that the way I grew up with it had a lot to do with that. It's hard to say exactly what, you know, there are a lot of things that kind of molded me into how how I am with the musical community. And I guess the first thing I would say is that I wasn't I wasn't pushed in a way from my parents like they were they didn't push me to do it. I was the one driving myself to do it. And if anything, I, I mean, I remember my my dad, we were we'd be riding in the car listening to some doc watson cassette tape yes. you know in, yes. in his old uh in his old van and and he would be calling out the changes like oh that's four minor two two major you know and i would i would get frustrated that i couldn't do it as fast as he could so, but, but <laughs> right he, right no it was, but he was all you yeah totally totally he wasn't pushing me to do it he wasn't like you have to learn this he was he was so gentle with it and kind of fun with it that I just, I was just like, I have to be able to do this. And that's kind of how that started. But, and I think also, you know, growing up in a way, I never went to music school, which I think I'm really glad that I didn't. Although a lot of my friends who went to music school made a lot of great connections that at one point in my life, I, I felt like I missed out in a way, but it was a trade off because I, I had a lot of other experiences being on the road and, and, um, you know, with a couple different bands and doing my own thing here at home, I think it, it shaped me in a really, really, uh, you know, I, I, it's hard to find, find the word. No, but I, okay. You're doing, you're doing, you're doing, you're doing fantastic. I I think it's music is sacred. And and I think I, I didn't grow up in this, you know, I grew up in a small town, which has its own drawbacks, of course, but the community here was so great. And I truly believe that the, the environment, and the people that we surround ourselves with become our reality. They shape us. Hmm. So that, that had a lot to do with, that had a lot to do with who I am today. Just where I, you know, I didn't grow up in the middle of um, New York city or, or, you know, part of some family that was deep into a music conservatory with all this pressure to like be somebody. It's like, that's it's kind of along the lines of like you you need to be somebody right. someday exactly. instead of just be yourself because that's really what harbors the best creativity and the most wholesome pure approach to music and that's when the feeling really comes across in music which is really all that matters <sighs> dude i'm already having a ball man you are I, you know what it is like um how liberating is it? This is really important. I know you're not a, exactly an elder, but um, how liberating is it? I think part of the, I think Sam went to Berkeley, never finished. So many cats that I've talked to, Vinny Kaliuta, John Schofield, these guys, they didn't even finish Berkeley because there was so much, there was so much work on the road and they'd go on the road 
with a big band. I mean, things have changed, but do you feel like, at least in hindsight, because you had this very, I'm going to say, street scholar approach to music, even though it was a rural area, you were surrounded by music, and then you never, never, it was never put into you, like, there's this, there's one way to do it. Like, you could make up your own system of learning. And that has carried you through to a successful career as a producer and a musician. You know, so I, I'm curious mm-hmm. about, like, um, was there a crossroads at a certain point? I mean, Eastman's just a stone's throw away from, from from where you were. Or did you ever consider, was that something that people were like, oh, Aaron, man, you're, you got to... You got to go to school, man. It's just a logical next step. And you're like, well, actually, I'd rather get on the road and, 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 and work it out on the bandstand. Yeah, there, there was a crossroads, actually. When I was finishing high school, I was all set in a lot of ways to go to school for jazz, piano, and guitar. Mm. Um, and kind of in that process with me graduating, I... I I, I hated high school. I just, I, I was getting good grades and everything, but I, I got in a lot of trouble and, and I graduated a half year early. I like took this English class at the college the summer before to knock out some credits and I got (laughs) out of there and, and I had, um, connected with, uh, another guy from the town I grew up in. His name is Matt Goodwin, who, um, kind of brought me into this Rochester music scene when I was like 15 wow, and he's probably, I think he's six years older than me. So he was in his early twenties at the time. And then I got to meet all these guys, including, um, the members of giant Panda gorilla dub squad, which is this band that I toured in <clears throat> for almost seven years from when I was 16 to like 22 or 23. And so the crossroads was okay. I'm, I'm either going to go to, you know, music school with kind of an aimless thing, which a lot of people do, they just know that that's the next step. That's right. What is, what is the next step? You either, somebody either has to set you up with something great, or you have to be in a band or, you know, further the career somehow and going to school, there's like all these choices. So that's the obvious choice for a lot of people, but I had this unique choice and my parents were supportive, which was very, you know, it was very bold of them to do that because they did, you know, they trusted the guys in the band, but you know, their 16 year old, 17 year old son is like, they want what's best for him. And, and it was, it was the greatest thing ever. I mean, there was, it, it shaped, it gave me a lot of the connections that I have today. A lot of the people I have, I play music with today, like Rick Robertson. I never would have met him if I wasn't in that band wow. and touring in Boston. I met him at one of the shows there because we had a mutual friend. And, and then I ended up leaving that band, uh, started to do my own thing, but it really shaped me in a lot of ways. It gave me the chops and like, you know, I was like a road warrior by the time I was, <laughs> you know, 19. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that, that it just, it came across. Year. I'm like, this guy is a pro. I'm like, I mean, a pro for me is just somebody who, I mean, even in a non gig setting, I was like, it, it was, uh. It was emboldening to see that. And then obviously um, in Sam's band, I mean, it seems like, I mean, everybody has their own story, but um, th- you guys are all kind of following that on that same frequency. But I, I, you know, the, when you, I would love you to talk about, if you've had this experience, uh, I've talked to, I remember the late grade, I'm not sure if you ever crossed paths with, uh, <clears throat> uh, Kofi Burbridge, who is uh, O'Teal Burbridge's uh, brother, he was a uh, phenomenal, phenomenal mm-hmm. multi instrumentalist. And, uh, you know, like at 13, he was playing concerts at Howard University with Donald Byrd and Ron Carter, but he was also in like Tedeschi Trucks Band, you know, it, rest in peace. And, but he told me he was on the road with. Um, like Felix Pastorius, pretty heavy band with, uh, um, you know, um, Jeff Coffin and a couple other guys. They were playing like fusion music and he, you know, they were on this rugged road trip, you know, tour and they were in the middle of the Carolinas or somewhere and, 
you know, the weather was really bad and, and they were all just like exhausted and they were playing this sports bar and people really could have cared less if they were there or weren't there. And he was under the weather. He was actually like really sick. And he, um, he said, you know, the only thing he could really think about was like getting through the gig, but he was out of his normal thinking mindset. And he said, collectively, the band just went to a place they had never gone before. And he himself did as well. And I just wonder, you know, you talk about accessing your multidimensional self. And I just wonder if you early on in that road, road warrior um, experience, if you had one of those situations where you were sick as a dog and all you could think about was crawling into bed and yet you got off the bandstand and people were like, holy cow, I've never heard you play like that before. Sometimes like that to me is the most powerful. I mean, for me, I could walk into a show and not feel good psychically or spirit, you know, psychologically. And then once I lock into the groove of the music, I get spiritual healing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, and it's a physical thing too. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about early on, like when you weren't at your best, but yet you allowed, you became a conduit for the music. Mm, yeah, that that's a great question, Jake. I, yeah, there's a few things I can think of, but I guess it really makes me think about when I, especially mentioned Kofi Burbage, you know, rest in peace. I saw him play a few times. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, yeah. yeah I, I, n- I never met him, but yeah, phenomenal musician. And, you know, but, my beginning of my relationship with the Hammond B3, which is definitely one of my favorite instruments to play out, oh. of, the, out of all the ones I've dabbled in. And I, I bought an organ and we took it on tour with this band and I had never really, I had played a different type of Hammond organ, but not like a real B3. So my, I think my newness to it and not being a piano player beforehand. And th- there were, there was one moment in particular I I remember where it really clicked, where it was kind of like I was coming from this place of not having too much influence mm-hmm. of it. I had barely even heard John Modeski. I had heard him maybe a little bit. And we were in this crazy band playing Afrobeat reggae stuff, <laughs> like really psychedelic oh stuff. Oh, my. Dude, this sounds and ridiculous, we would, man. It, we would take these jams out to like outer space because the, the you know the other guys in the band were were totally into that stuff and it was really the, that was my favorite part of the show and the organ added a huge element to that so I, there was this huge space and I remember one time we were at playing at this on the beach somewhere in Maryland and and I I just like had this great show total breakthrough felt totally fearless and. I wasn't physically sick, but I, I remember feeling like I was kind of sick of being like stuck in a rut. I'd been doing it for a few years and I was like, I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing. And, that, and, and it really clicked with me. Like I started like completely like taming this creature of an organ and like, you know, hearing it roar and like pushing up the volume pedal and mm. pulling out the draw bars and, and, you know, slide up and down it and, and playing really like amazing shit you know at the time that's what it felt like and um is there a record so, i mean I, I is there a recording of that show <laughs> I, no you know what you know what it is it, you just it just sparked because the, the the physical illness is one thing but when i interviewed joe russo he said that he was in a band called fat mama and in a sports bar and he said at that moment, just the way you said it, I mean, not that, that um, I'm sure you, on the beach people were grooving to the music and, and having a ball, but he said that he stopped playing in fear. You said fearless, but basically you felt like that um, you, he, he just, he could liberate. Nobody in the bar really like was listening to them. It was a sports bar. They were playing funk and, and rock. But he just, it was like one of those epiphany moments where he stopped worrying about what he was playing and he just let himself groove it out and stop playing in fear. And I just, that to me only comes from bandstand experience. Do you agree? I absolutely agree because you, you reach a point where 
you know, when you're in a band and you're, you're first in a band, it, there's this idea that you have to always be playing the right stuff and you can really easily get in your head about it. And what, what I experienced was exactly that. I stopped playing with fear and became completely in the moment, not like, not even thinking ahead mm. other than just, you know, muscle memory of the songs and being like completely present in the song. And also that it, that kind of requires a certain type of frustration, almost reaching like a breaking point of tension in yourself where you're like, I'm frustrated that I, that I can't do this or this hasn't been as good or something. And then it's like, you know what? Screw it. Like I don't care anymore. And then that's when the real music starts happening. Dude, Aaron Lip, waxing poetic here on the Jake Feinberg show. I mean, do you? How do you work with, um, like in the studio? Um, I don't want to say you have one kind of methodology. But do you feel like you know every? See everything today, man. It's so beautiful that you have bec- that you cut your own path. I mean, because there, everyone has their own book. A chord book, their music book. There's so much literature. Everything's been codified, and you know you did not have that. You had the open road as it related to how you took on music and grew and learned. You reached breaking points. You wanted to do it yourself. Do you feel like uh, in the studio? Um, what are some of the subtleties that you use specifically like miking techniques in order to allow the uh, music to breathe? You know, I haven't listened to a huge amount of the catalog of, of the sessions you've done in terms of other bands recording people, but I do have an issue with um, modern recorded music and it's not even digital versus analog. It's more about, how people are miking the room. And I just wanted you to talk about how you've maybe created your own, um, you know, sort of roadmap for recording music and allowing that music to breathe. Man, another great question, Jake. That, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot to say about yeah, that. Well, the so floor I, is yours, my I brother. A, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I have a, I do have a lot of different things that I do, but I would say in general, the thing that I, the thing that I love to focus on is, you know, you don't want it to sound sterile. What we're doing is we're, we're capturing an experience. And when we listen to a recording that we've never heard, we're, we're not thinking about it in the sense of, you know, is this sounding perfect sonically or is this pure? Where all that comes through is the emotion behind it. And this is something that I've I learned from just years of experience. And, and also um, I studied with this amazing producer guy, Rob Froboni, who who lives down in Woodstock. Yeah, I kind of know that name. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah he, he, he he's amazing. He he taught me a lot. I met him through through another friend, Cass Haley, when we were doing a record together and down in Texas, and he he just blew my mind with all his his mystical wisdom of <laughs> production. And he's the guy who he did he was he designed Shangri La back when the band was. That's why. And, and thank you, yeah. thank you so much. He was in there the Shangri La documentary, yeah. and uh, also. A, I'm also a huge fan of Rick, Rick Rubin. Um, oh my! Well, no, I also uh, Shangri La and Richard Manuel was was eating kerosene hamburgers in the shed. Bath. That was the that that was insane. That whole thing. Go yeah. go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, so between my my time with him mixing records with him and and doing my own thing here, just what I have here is I have a studio that's in my house, and I'm currently building a a big barn that's going to be kind of studio. Two I got to get out there immediately, dude. Yeah. I'm yeah, coming you know, up. Dude. Yeah. You gotta come by, <laughs> I'm coming by. The, dude. Yeah. As far as miking techniques go, I, I welcome Mike bleed leakage, man. Yeah. Leakage is there's it, good leakage, right? Yeah. Good, good leakage. Ex- exactly. But it has to be the right kind of leakage. It, you got to make sure you're not having funny phase issues, but if you can, 
if you can put the thing, put the mics and the amps in the right place in the room where the drums are, then you create this, ex- you create this soundscape where it's like you are in the room. And that's a huge part of what I think making records that sound timeless rather than something that's completely dry and like very clean. Although, and you can have the best of both worlds while making a, a great record too. And, um, and I use a, a huge variety of, of ribbons, dynamics and condensers. And, and I do, I never mic a drum kit the same way twice. Oh, I love it. I, 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 I cannot I believe you just, that, I was going to ask you, cause like, you go back, there's an album I'll, I'll hip you to. It's kind of a mercurial album. Uh, Bernie Ledden, when he left the <clears throat> the Eagles, he teamed up with his, his buddy Michael Georgiatis, and they did this really r- random record together uh, in Neil Young's old studio. Late 70s, Glenn Johns was the producer. And, and, oh, wow, yeah. And, and, you know, Glenn, like, he... David Kemper, who I interviewed, was, like, the drummer. He talked about... Like there was maybe one left and right overhead and then maybe one mic on the kick drum. It, the point is what you just said. It's cre- it's capturing an experience in time and puts you as the listener in the room. And this, I mean, it was Neil Young's, the studio obviously was spectacular. But um, tell me a little bit about, like, do you ever, do you, you never mic the drum kit the same way once, twice. But, um... Are, have you ever like mic the entire kit? That's the biggest problem I have with. And again, I don't want to use genres, but so much modern music is missing dynamics and good leakage. Have you? Have you? Do you ever just mic? Because I and I, I think that they're that when you mic the entire kit, then you're taking away a lot of space. I just wonder what you you know, you know, if you could talk about a, spe- yeah. a specific time when you were maybe you were you like the band or you guys, you couldn't figure, you just figured it out and made it up and it came out perfect. Yeah. There, there have been multiple times where, you know, maybe a little earlier in the studio days where there were limitations. It's kind of like the necessity is the mother of invention idea. Whoa, I, whoa. Like, I yep. only had maybe, there was a time when I only had eight channels to work with. There was a time when I only had 12 channels to work with. And I had a bunch of people in here and I'm like, okay, well I have to, I have to mic this. I have to mic this. That leaves me with only, um, you know, four drum mics. And then maybe I, maybe I, you know, should put a mic over here on this other thing that needs it. So that leaves me with three drum mics and oftentimes three drum mics in the right places sound better than anything that you nailed it i love this i freaking love it and i i've there i've definitely done a few sessions where i where i even have just two where where, where, if you had if you had two you'd put like one overhead and one by the kick or or just depends (laughs) that that i did one session like that where i had a mono overhead yeah and then one kind of far away from the kick but you know, facing the kick. And then there was another session where I just had a kick drum and a mic that was kind of pointing at the snare from the side, about a foot away from it. And I kept, I kept doing tests just to see if the cymbal crash was going to hit well enough. And I kept moving it and I got it in the right spot where when the cymbal crash, you could hear it well enough. And it was two mics and it was a, it was an SM 57 on the snare and the kick mic was an re20 two dynamic mics very simple just put in the right spot tune the drums up real nice and put them in the right spot and let the room do the work do you feel like this is so beautiful do you feel like because of the saturation of technology in today's world that people feel compelled to have to use it all when in reality the stripped down model is, you know, and I also, I guess maybe the point is like, you know, do people, can people, I guess the, the thing that I care about, the music that I love, you know, I mean, uh, the, any genre that it's like, it just, it's the, it, it's warm and it's, and it feels good and it feels like you're in the room. And, um, 
I just wonder, like, this is more of an opinion question, but it's just like you have every kind of tool available now. Um, and But that doesn't mean you have to use it. And in fact, it might behoove you to not use it and just trust your gut and instinct and go with a more minimal, minimalist approach. But I just wonder if you, you know, like you haven't really had to, um, I just think maybe less curated cats or people that, you know, they just believe that because we have the technology that it should all be used. The problem is you suck all the soul out of the music. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. There's, it, there's a fine line with all of that because it really makes me think about the analog to digital thing. I, I used to be such a purist with analog right. and really only want to do things to tape. And then I realized, well, you know, the digital age is there's so many amazing things about the digital age. And, and the as far as the analog thing goes, that was just it's just like a feeling that you get when you're tracking to tape, which changes the way that you play when you know you're doing it to tape. Absolutely. And I think that I think that has more of an effect than the actual sound, although the sound of tape is amazing. But as far as all the tools we have available to us today, I, I do think I've learned from experience from overusing plugins, overusing compression, mm-hmm. overusing EQ, and and ruining a mix, and then just completely starting from scratch and putting like a fraction of that stuff on it, and then just really... You know, the, the mix approach, everybody has their own way of doing that, but it's very sensitive and very subtle, and I think that's the way to go for for me, kind of like a minimalist approach, but that you have to, you have to track having that in mind, too. Like, you have to track like you're making a record, not like you're just getting a sound and then you're going to do a bunch of low cuts on it later. Like, I always have a have a goal in mind when I make a record. And one of those goals is to not use any EQ or right. very, or very little, you know, maybe some on, on the buses, but, but I don't ever have a ton of EQ on individual tracks because I mic things accordingly and I track accordingly. Like, Oh, this, I'm going to put this on this because this is going to complement that frequency wise and like just tonally um it takes the, more the, work up front but no well like, that but that that was it's just so funny you said that because john simon who was the producer on those great band albums the big pink and the brown album it was back then it was all pre-production they got the idea in their head they talked about the concept what they wanted it to sound like There was almost no post-production. And in today's world, not saying Aaron Lip studio, but um, there's so much post-production. The the other question about the studio, uh, you know, I mean, you're very, um, you know, you're going to, you know, person comes in, they want to hire you to be a producer. Are you adamant about if it's possible to, to, for everybody in the band to hit at the same time. That's the other problem with, you know, just the convenience of technology is that you can, you know, you know, you know, um, airdrop, uh, you know, a a guitar track and then link it in. Uh, You can email these files and put it all together. A lot of that music is done that way because they want certain people. But do you um, have a credo that, it's important when you are recording that everybody is hitting at the same time. You mean everything being tracked live at once? Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, if it's maybe, maybe not the vocals, but, but you know, the idea of having the whole rhythm section in the room at the same time, I'm just curious about how important that is to you as as sort of a, an adherence to the quality of the sacred quality of recorded music. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very important. I think when and actually, there's a great there's a great interview with Glenn Johns himself talking about this exact thing. Oh, I love it. Um, it's when you're when you're tracking with other people, as opposed to like somebody, because I've done this too. Somebody sends me a track that they've done to a click, acoustic guitar and voice, 
and I play drums to it because I play a lot of drums in the studio. And it's not the same as them sitting here doing a scratch vocal, <clears throat> scratch guitar track with me playing drums across from them. That's right. It is totally different. It comes out so much better if you're doing it with the person in the room because you're reacting to what they're doing in real time. And you can't like listen to it over and over. And there's a there's a push and a pull that both people have or, or three or four people have in a room that you you just can't get that if you're playing to a track. And that that's the magic of music is like the, the interaction between the band members at the time. So I really do try to do as much as we can live. Often we we even do keep a lot of the live vocals. It depends on the the singer and, and what they want and what they're happy with. But I've even I've even pushed them to keep the live vocal because I thought it was so good and we couldn't do any better. And being a singer, you can get pretty critical about your voice. Like, oh, I could do that better. But then you end up comping a, a bunch of takes and then it's like, oh, let's just use the original anyway. <laughs> I love it, man. You, you know, that is so beautiful, man. So you, you have said, you, you've talked to, to the, to the artist or the singer and being like, no, this, we got to keep, this is, the, this is the truth right here. Yeah, yeah yeah and sometimes it works to convincing them and sometimes it doesn't right. and that's just the you know i gotta, gotta hey you gotta put no man i mean i was trans i was listening back to one of my interviews with chuck rainey and he's like hey man he's like somebody hires me to play bass and maybe i'm doing my thing and but they don't like it and they want me to do it a certain way he's like i'll do it the way they want me to do it you know it's just the way it is i want to get called back i want to get hired again you know and so mm -hmm. i mean it's not you know from my own um is there a seminal Aaron Lip recording of your own music that you can point people to where there's good leakage, um, it's it's a bright recording? I, you know, that to me is like, it's, I'm not going to critique, you know, I'm, I don't want to just be critical, but I also want to point people in the direction of saying, okay, this is what Jake is talking about in terms of brightness, dynamics, tension and release, pulse and being in the room is there i'm sure there's many but maybe is there a, a tune or a, an album in particular of yours that that you can highlight mm -hmm. yeah yeah my my latest ep uh it's called no time too soon and there's a track on there called it's only there's four tracks and they're they were all done here all the vocals are completely live wow. Wow. And all the, I think there's only a few overdubs on the whole thing. All the drums and bass and vocals were completely live. There's one track where everything is completely live. And you can really hear the sound of the room and the, and the experience in it. It, it. it took a lot of work to get there and, and, you know, hiring the right people. You know, it was, it was some good friends who happen to be amazing musicians and, uh, you know, getting the right songs together was a big part of that. But yeah, that's the, I guess that's what I would suggest as far as trying to. What tune is the one that every, that was all live? Um, that one is called You'll Be Going Again. I cannot wait to throw that on. You'll Be Going Again. That's a, there's actually a video of it. And that was there's all live. That is just, you know, um, I'm curious because in your bio that I read, um, you know, you were with Robert Randolph. You you were touring a lot with the Gorilla Dub Band, obviously. And then, um, you know, 2013, you at least it said you, you took some time uh, continuing on other projects, learning other instruments. I mean, you were like Clawhammer, banjo, dulcimer, all this, you know, old time fiddle music. Has Aaron Lip ever had to like... Have you always been able to sing for your supper, playing or producing music that you wanted to, or was there a period of time when you were had to take the the bar mitzvah gig or the corporate gig because it just it it, it would it paid the bills, or have you actually even at your young age you're not a gray beard by any means have you always been able to? kind of get off and make a living playing the music you want to make or record? Um, no, 
No, I <laughs> good. haven't. No, okay, yeah, for, good. Yeah. For for many years, I I actually was uh, building houses, and I and then I built my house here. So I, I've done a lot of that. I've done a lot of construction work. I've done a, I when I was a teenager, I worked in a couple of restaurants. You know, I had a couple of those jobs early on. But when I moved back to Naples, when I started doing my own thing, after I got off the road with with Panda, I I started working building houses, and that was I had a, a day job and I was you know swinging a hammer. Wow! And also I started a band called the Cabin Killers, which was a really fun band. That was like ten years ago. We had that band. We put out an album. I think. You can find that that old record somewhere. <laughs> and, <laughs> Hold on, were you were you were you the architect on? Were you designing the houses too? No, in in the early days, I learned a lot of building from my dad. Of course, when I was yeah. A kid, and then I worked for a, I worked for a couple different guys around town, some amazing builders that I was just like on the crew, wow. you know, and they were they were running the crew, and and then I designed my house and and built it. So, so, but in, 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 from a musical gig point of view, um, you, you've kind of been able to pick and choose outside of, you know, building houses. I mean, you know, you're on a crew, it's New York state, you know, I don't know if it's a union gig or not, but you're getting pretty good pay for that. Uh, and, um, I just wonder, I mean, so many people, uh, so many musicians, uh, I, you know that's that's one reason I will always continue to do my show because I just I am bound and determined to to make people aware one person at a time that music is a viable profession and it's an important profession in this culture. I'm not talking about Japan or Europe where Clearly, the incent, the understanding, and the significance of music is there. Uh, the clubs are subsidized by the government in Europe, um, you know, and um, and I just I I wonder about like the idea of this band with with Sam and Rick and all these cats, man. I mean, what is the intention? There's no expectation for me. I've learned no expectations. That, that that's the killer. But if your intention, what are your intentions for 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 going on the road? I mean, you guys had a crazy tour, and there was an infrastructure there. I mean, I, I met the sound guy, and and there were other cats hanging about, and I just wonder when you collectively got on, decided to hit the road with this band. You know what what were the intentions? Because I I, I mean, it's a big. I have to believe that there's just. There's not a lot of money for for the gigs themselves anymore, which has changed a lot. You make a lot on the merch table now. And once you divvy it up and put it back into records and stuff, there's just not a lot to go around. And and I wanted you to talk about just the fact, you know, the, the intentions for this, the concept of this group and what you want to um, get across as it continues on. Yeah, so as far as the Sam Grisman project goes, when we started, it was like a even over a year and a half ago because we, we got together well before that. And I think, you know, the idea then was to was to be able to play whatever we want to play and have fun, but still not be playing to an empty room all the time because that, is, that can kill your soul as a musician where you're like, you put your heart into it and then, you know, nobody comes. So except if Jake of, Feinberg shows up and then I'm going to be a maniac and I get it. No, I'm totally with you, man. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and part of that was, you know, Rick and Sam grew up in music together and, and Sam's an amazing musician. And I had, I had known him for, for years through, through Rick and, and, you know, they kind of brought the idea up to me to, be a part of it and and i was super into it and we did some videos at at the studio here we did we did some recordings and i think you know the main idea was exactly what i just said and that's kind of exactly what we do and it's you know it's it's a little different because we 
you know, we play, we all kind of contribute what we want to play, but it's, it's, it's beautiful thing where we all say, Oh, this is what I want to sing tonight. Hmm. You know, it's not like there's different things that are important to every member. And we all like really hear everybody and do that. And one of, you know, one of the things that I like to do is keep, keep it interesting, not, not repeat songs sometimes for seven or eight shows. So we have a catalog of like, Oh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of songs that we, that we do. And, it was and, insane. Uh, I don't, first of all, that well, uh, he showed me, Sam showed me that on, on his laptop. I was totally blown away by the bag, how deep a bag of tunes that you guys play. But then I called out pig in a pen and you're like, here we go. And you just, you just cooked away, man. He didn't, didn't even think twice about it. And I think Sam, had, that's not, was not one that you, uh, but, but you like the idea of, Hey, you know what? We all have the rudiments. We all have a great foundation of music. Let's go out on a limb and, you know, let's do, let's, let's just keep it interesting for ourselves. Mm. That's important to you yeah. though. That That's one of the things that, that is important for you. Yeah. It, it, it's kind of the most important thing for me because, you know, personally being on the road is very hard. A lot of the time I have a really amazing home life. I have a live in a beautiful place. I have an amazing girl and you know, just things are great here. So when I go out on the road, I try to make the most of it and, and really kind of stimulate and push myself as a musician. And that, that pig in a pen exa- example is great because you called out pig in a pen. It was late at night and, and I started playing it in, in a key of E in like a slow shuffle, which it was kind of like made it into like a bit of a soul tune. Oh my God. It was there. so <laughs> great, man. Yeah, man. It was not like the old and in the way record, you know, at all. No, yeah. no. And that's one thing we, we love to do is, is do some of these songs in a totally different way. Like put it to a Zydeco beat, you know, mm. make, slow it down or speed it up, make, you know, turn he's gone into a gospel tune, high energy and, Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but we try it out and it keeps it interesting for us, which kind of keeps fueling the the magic and that spontaneity as as opposed to just playing the same set every night because there's it playing the same set every night and playing every song the same all the time gets so old and it's it's unsustainable if you want to keep making music and really tapping into the the soul of music, which is part of part of that is this being in the moment and it's hard to be in the moment all the time when you're doing the same thing every night. What is your, I, I just have to say this cause I just detected that, um, what, if, if your dad hears this, is it, do you feel like, uh, you would like him to, uh, play more music, uh, with you now? <laughs> yeah, I, I do because you know I, I mean the, 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 what I'm saying is your folks who I think I need to interview actually because they sound total badasses but it's like they you are like the consummate the 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 musician that that I look at and I say okay um he ne- they never play the same song the same way once they I mean they don't play it safe I mean, there are. That's the thing that's remarkable to me is that there are bands out there that are like making good dough on the road. Maybe they have a, a mark. Maybe they have a reputable name, and they're playing the same show every night. And that's what the audiences want. And I almost feel like you guys. It's so imperative to go and be like, actually, no. You you should hear this differently. You're gonna dig it. You will dig it. You need to dig it. You need to get people come and expect a performance. I do not want to see a performance. I want people going over the edge and hitting that spiritual spot. And maybe they hit a clam, but everybody goes with it. And I just feel like your folks deserve a lot of credit for giving you that aesthetic and that point of view. Because it's, it's you know, Rick's got it. I'm not saying, I mean, Sam's, you know, people have it. But I just say, um, well, you just said before, you said at the beginning, you said my dad's not playing as much anymore, and I just feel like 
I want this to be a catalyst for him to listen to it and maybe get motivated to uh, start playing some Larry Graham funk bass lines again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, it's funny you say that because he, I, there were many years where I wished that he would play more and then I really got to a place where I totally respected his decision to just totally change his musical life. I mean, he, he played bass for years. I even got him to play bass in in one of my bands years ago for about a year. What band was, was that? What band was that? That was that was the Cabin Killers. Oh that my! Was, I, there, yeah, I like, need to find that record. It was that, was that an LP you put out, or is it online? I got to find it's that. A, it's a full record. I, I believe it's on Spotify. Yeah. The cabin, and your your dad was playing bass fiddle or electric. He so he's not on that record, but he played bass in that band. Oh my god, that's um, awesome. He played upright, fretless, and or he played upright and electric fretless in that band for about a year. Oh my god. And and then he started playing he, I mean he he did all kinds of stuff. He built I'm I'm sitting here in my studio with two Irish bazookies that he built. He built <laughs> couple, he built two sets of bagpipes. He got heavy into Irish music for years. And then he just, and then he stopped and it, and, and he lives totally off grid. He totally simplified his life in this really beautiful way. And he plays Dobro now. And he, I was just over there a couple of weeks ago um, with my girlfriend and, and his partner and we were playing music like, like we hadn't in, in years. And I was like, wow, this is, I totally get it. Like he, he just simplified his life. He, he doesn't go you know, he doesn't go too many places. He grows almost all his own food. Wow. It's pretty amazing. And so really, I don't I don't wish that he did anything differently than he does now, in a way. I mean, if he felt inspired to and wanted to, I would welcome it. No, it's absolutely perfect. I mean, you, you, you guys don't live that far apart. And if the, if the muse, follow the muse and you get together and jam, it's obvious that, you know, he's living a, he's, he's, he's got a satisfied mind, as Bob Dylan said, you know, it's like, yeah, he's got, uh, he played, what about your mom? What, what, what's your mom's, is she still playing music too? Yeah, she does. She, she definitely does. She plays guitar and sings and plays piano. I'm, I'm trying to get her a new piano right now. Cause piano she's got, is not, <clears throat> not too up to snuff. You gotta but, bang, you gotta bang it back yeah. into tune or something, you know? Yeah. You gotta get her a new one. Yeah. Yeah. She still, she still plays from time to time. Not as much as I think she used to, but she's getting back into it. She, she'll never stop playing and, and singing. So, we, you know, yeah. uh, one final question and set, set one for Aaron Lip. It's been an absolute honor to have you on the program. Um, I want you to talk about the, the, the being in that, band at 16 or 17 i don't know where what venue you were playing maybe you're playing the paradise in boston or the cantab lounge or who knows middle east but i want you to talk about the first time that you laid eyes on rick robertson yeah that's a very important part of the story here so it was in fact at the paradise rock club yes i went to be you that, so yeah i know that place <laughs> that we met <laughs> I was on tour with Giant Panda, and I, we had a mutual friend. Um, yeah, this guy Andrew Terrett, who at the time called himself Tubby Love, <laughs> and he brought he brought uh, he brought Rick there at the time. Uh, he was wearing a Iron Maiden shirt and had a mandolin slung across his back, and had this you know kind of prankster looking smile. And he comes up to me and he's like, "Oh, I heard you like old time music," and I. You know, the way that he remembers it is that I that I leaned down off the stage from sound check with my MV3 and I was like got really serious and I was like, Yes I do. <laughs> <laughs> um wait, so you would so even though you were you were ensconced in this Afrobeat funk fest, at that point you would you in your downtime you were already completely immersed in the in the uh old time fiddle music. I was. I was yeah, in a very different way than than him and his his friends, you know, from down south had. Like I, I had my experience from up here, and I hadn't gone to school, and I hadn't I hadn't had as much immersion in it as they did. But I had my own experience. Well, of course, dude, you're making dude. You've always it's, you've always made up your own curriculum. You know, you got to make sure that you again. I don't want to codify it, but really, man, 
it's it's an off the grid curriculum and it's very effective. You can t- I mean it's how but I mean if I remember correctly with Rick too, he he had a lot of bandstand experience too. What was what were they just raised was he raised in a more um traditional setting with the fiddle music so to speak? Um I I mean he he went to a lot of like fiddle camps and and mandolin camps when he was young and got exposed to bluegrass at a really young age earlier than i did i was into country music and kind of rock and roll but i wasn't so much into into bluegrass uh, until i was you know more in my later teens but he and then he went to berkeley as well and you know doing the string program so he was really he was really you know, thick, thick in that for a while. And then once, once I met him, I, it was, I think I was maybe 19 or 20 when we met and we're about the same age. So I got heavy into that music kind of in a different way when I met him and we started hanging out all the time, going to festivals down South and just picking tunes all day, learning new tunes, guitar, mandolin, fiddle, banjo, whatever, all of it. And yeah, that was a that was a big big part of my musical story and how it's how it's developed today. Obviously, because we're in a we're in a band. We were in a we were in a band before called the Rigs. That was that was amazing. It was a kind of short lived and and we had Oliver Wood from the Wood Brothers produce our record wow. and uh, we spent a lot of time up here actually writing the music for that record and and then we kind of he moved to New Orleans. We parted ways for a few years, and then and then we started hanging out again. I'd go down there to visit him. He came up here a couple of times and reconnected as fate would have it. And and now he lives up here. He lives I up know. Up. No, that's what I was. I mean, I read a couple of his posts once in a while when they pop them up my feed, and he's like, and I remember him talking about it when I was in Scottsdale. Just the idea of like going up to to lip country because he's just, and I just wonder. If you could talk about, you know, as, as objectively as you can, because you're right in it, how have you influenced him positively and how has he enhanced you? Because, it, you know, there's nothing, the musical romance thing is like, as a non-musician, you know, I I see it and I have a pretty good nose to detect like the authentic romance. And this is like a deep, deep musical uh, connection. And I just wonder how you guys have, you know, enhanced each other, if you can answer that question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. From from my perspective, I, I think, for me, I mean, he's he's been one of the, the biggest influences musically uh, on me in a lot of ways. He's, um, he's always been somebody who likes to do things differently, mm-hmm than everybody else is doing. He's always pushed the envelope of making totally original art. And I've really, um, you know, I really started to gravitate towards that mindset largely because of, because of him and also because of my own trajectory, but he's been a, he's been a big inspiration in that way for me and not falling into these, he, he's definitely someone who doesn't fall into any category of any kind, which is very, very, uh, that's like a sacred thing to have. I love yeah, lot, ge- genre list. Yeah, totally. Yeah. A lot of musicians get pigeonholed because of the pressure from the industry. And he's always fought back in that way. And that's why he's so unique and so great and so different is because he doesn't, he doesn't subscribe to any of that. He completely just, you know, just circumvents all that. And as a result, you know, it's, he, he doesn't play the game like other people do. And a lot of people play that game so well that they, you know, they become super famous because they're, they're part of the industry and they kind of sell out in a way, but he, he doesn't do that at all. And as talented as he is, he certainly, you know, could, but he, he just doesn't because he's not that type of guy. And, and I think our musical relationship, we, we just, you know, we're also great friends, which has a lot to do with it. We, we spend a lot of time together, even when we don't 
we're not playing. And I think, I think I was really interested in his approach to, to music and life. And he was really interested in my approach to music and life. And that's why partially, partially why he came up here. We've been talking about it for a while. He was kind of done with new Orleans for a number of reasons and some things really aligned and, yeah, he found a found a great spot just a little ways away from here, and it was the right timing, and it was right around when we started this project, and we we get together fairly fairly often, even when we're when we're not playing, which is a which is a beautiful thing, and and you know I think he's always been interested in living in the country, and now he's he does that, and he's getting immersed in all the all the good things that, that has to offer <laughs> no dude i gotta tell you man you know, it, <laughs> mad uh, props to mad props to, to to you guys all you because it was seeping out of you at when i met you man it was just so there all of you guys like and i know you don't need the reinforcement you know to stay on your path but it just feels good man it feels good and there's not a lot that it just you don't find that a lot in today's world. You, you get people who just want to stay in their comfort zone. I guess that's you know more questions keep coming. My final question for you in this set one is just where do you feel like you need to push yourself out of your comfort zone, personally or or music or professionally? I mean, is is there? I don't want to say an elephant in the room, but is there an area where you just know that you? The only times in my life that I've really grown has been through adversity or be pushing myself beyond what I thought I could handle. And it's always been cathartic. And I just wonder if there's something that you, that you've been thinking about that you want, you know, you want to push yourself out of your comfort zone so you can keep growing. Yeah. Well, I think, I think being, you know, starting this project and deciding to be on the road a certain amount is part of that. Because in a way, that's that's out of my comfort zone, and right. I've definitely become a better musician and performer with this particular group. And I would say the other really important thing to me, it, you know, one of the utmost important things is always continuing to write good songs, and that's another thing that that Rick's been hugely influential on. And you know, I think we've written some stuff together and with other people, and and we share that value you know, really intensely of like the, that's kind of the only thing that, that matters really is like writing good songs because they last forever. That's and right. it's like, it's just the most beautiful thing when you can write a song that is so fucking good that people love it and it changes the way people think and changes the way that you think. And that is like, that's really where I'm pushing myself right now in my of time off here and in addition to you know building a 2000 square foot music studio yeah i mean you're, you're, you're like do i mean you you got your hands full man i mean you, man, you know i gotta tell you a part of me really wants to see aaron lip um laying kicking pedals on the hammond b3 just drums and bass playing some sticky bar i hope that day will come come soon but um you know, let's make it a point when I get back, let's, let's definitely do set two. And, uh, I'm definitely going to hit the, hit the road and, and, and come see you guys. I, I, um, I know you're playing a bunch of Southeast gigs and things like that, but I, I, my, uh, my goal is definitely get up to the, um, to your studio and, and hang, uh, maybe in the summer sometime would be great. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. Got a lot, got a lot going on up here in the summertime. So, definitely be in touch, Jake. No, Aaron, be cool, man. Much love to you, brother. We'll uh, we'll talk soon. All right, all right, be Peace. cool. Yeah.